Let me just start off by saying David Arquette is awesome. You may remember he was on the show a little over a year ago when his documentary called You Cannot Kill David Arquette was coming out. When we ended that interview, he said, Chris, the next one we do is gonna be in person. Now, not only was this interview in person, he drove to my house so we could record this. How amazing is that? Now, I just wanna put this out there that there are a few spoilers in this interview for the new Scream movie, which came out a few months ago. But a massive thank you to David Arquette for opening up about everything during this interview. And a huge thank you to Upstart for sponsoring this video because without them, none of this would have been possible. If you have multiple credit card balances and you're paying just the minimum every month and you're barely putting a dent in your credit card debt, it can feel discouraging. Upstart can help you pay off your existing credit card debt so you can feel like you're finally making some progress. Whether it's paying off credit cards, consolidating high interest debt, or funding personal expenses, over a million people have used Upstart to get one fixed monthly payment with a clear payoff date. And Upstart knows that you're more than just your credit score. So instead of using your credit score alone, they use other factors like your income, your employment, and other information on your application to get you a smarter rate for your loan. You can check your rate without impacting your credit score in just five minutes for loans between $1,000 to $50,000, and you can receive funds as fast as one business day after accepting your loan. Find out how Upstart can help you lower your monthly payment today by going to upstart.com CVV or just click that link down in the description. Again, it's upstart.com slash CVV. And if you are gonna visit the website, make sure to use our link so they know that we're the ones who sent you there. Again, it's upstart.com slash CVV. Now let's dive into this amazing conversation with the one, the only, David Arquette. Oh man, we are making this happen. We are. Thank you so much for coming by. My pleasure, thanks for having me. I, I re-watched Scream again on the weekend with my girlfriend who didn't, she, she loved the movie but didn't watch a lot of it because of, right. you know. <laughs> yeah. I've learned that if you could close your ears, it's a lot less scary. Just I don't know. A little tip out there from <laughs> horror movie. Close uh, your ears? Scared guy. <laughs> uh, the sound effects are, yeah. Yeah, they'll get you. They will get you. Do you think that's the character that you know the best of all the characters you've played? Yeah, I mean, it's so weird with Scream because it so parallels my life. You know what I mean? I, uh, you know, I it was right at the beginning of my career. It was the first thing that I got that really kind of launched me into the, a different level of, of celebrity or just even career. Um, I met my first wife on it. We had a kid. We got divorced. <laughs> I mean, they're like track my same the, thing happens with the character. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, and then uh, I met my new wife, and I've you know I had we had a daughter, and the, my first wife had a, a daughter with her, and then I have two boys now. While this last one came out, so it really was a whole a whole experience. And the crazy thing, I was actually just talking to Brandon about this right before you got here. You played Dewey for half your life. Yeah. Totally. I'm 50. And I did the first one you look when I was great, 25. Though. Thank you. Man. I, uh, I was 24 for a whole year before the first one. But <laughs> that's, a, that's a scream <laughs> reference. What do you think is the main thing you've really developed when you look back to the first scream and how you were as an actor then versus how you are as an actor in this new scream? Oh man, is there's just so much life experience that happens, <laughs> and you know, at the beginning you're kind of like, um, I don't know, you're kind of. There's like a naivety that, that get uh, that sounded so <laughs> so like naivety, <laughs> but uh, I don't know. There's just an element of just being green and just being new and being fresh and being full of like confidence <laughs> like all of this stuff yeah and then the more you like act it's all about then finding the real honest moments and when it like when you can really like embody the character really t tap into your emotions there were some scenes in that <laughs> in the version that the, this last scream that were so emotional that uh they went with a far less emotional take mm. and uh it's interesting because I've noticed that a lot of the time people have a kind of get uncomfortable if they see a man like showing extreme emotion. But if you've ever been in some like serious like 
kind of the stakes are really high in a emotional uh, experience, an argument or something like you could get really emotional. Sure. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> but it's so funny that when you do it on screen, it's like, oh, so they went with a safer take, but I would have, I would have liked to have challenged them to go with a little heavier take because essentially, like you said, we had experienced a lot of that stuff. And I'm drawing on stuff like, you know, my parent, my mom dying and my dad dying and like, you know, all of these, and Wes dying and like all of these things that were kind of playing. So I don't know. Yeah, the, there's like the subtlety that you play any of your characters with, I think is so impressive. <laughs> I don't think as an actor I've ever been called subtle. <laughs> so, thank you so much. <laughs> there's some, like it, when we first see Dewey in this movie, you're, you know, you're down and out, yeah. right? And you don't want to really talk to anybody. And you're like, I don't know, there's just like these little micro movements, these little micro uh, emotions that I think that you played so well. Oh, thank you, man. I'm sorry yeah. how squeaky this chair is. I know, is. I'm, a, I'm a squeaker too. I'm Do you just... want to switch? This one's not so squeaky. I actually won't. Yeah. No, let's Maybe I won't switch squeak here. as much. Look at this. Thank you. I'll try not to move as much. How I'm, I'm like always Still moving. look okay there? Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm just always like, what's this? I'm like a ball of like energy. There was actually something so small that you did in this one scene where you were getting up for some reason and you just like, you cracked your knuckles. And I don't know if that was... David cracking his knuckles, or that was Dewey cracking his knuckles, but it just felt so natural in that. I didn't plan it, so, and I don't typically crack my knuckles, so it might have just, oh, you know what? They might have added a knuckle crack if I was just like, because I do play with my hands a lot. So they might have added a knuckle crack. They did a lot of really cool stuff. There's one moment where I go, and I was trying to do it in the scene, and I thought I had done it blood spoiler alert yeah spoiler <laughs> alert spoiler lots of spoilers spoilers in this. So if you haven't okay. seen the film <laughs> uh, but um and then i saw the thing and i was like oh it worked and the, i but then i caught myself and i was like wait did you guys add that and they were like yeah we added that. <laughs> you're like i was, no, like, oh, I was trying to do it like i was literally trying to make that happen but you know i can't necessarily always see it but you know what from wrestling i learned a lot about acting yeah, like, really about being in the moment and just being real. Like the thing about wrestling is it's so over the top that when you can find the moments that are real and you like tap into something and you're really angry at someone and that comes across and the audience then feels it and you really are feeling it. That's really powerful stuff. And it was really interesting to see because it's a lot harder of a, a technique to do than a lot of people think. Like a lot of people think they're over the top or this or that. But if you try to like cut a promo, I'll try to cut a promo now! Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, I never really got to cut any promos. Cause none of those wrestling promotions took me seriously. Yeah, well you should take me seriously, you hear me? Man, I think you're coming back out of retirement. <laughs> I got another match in you. <laughs> Jeez. Oh, I love the wrestling business. I remember The Rock telling me that like the thing about wrestling is you've got to do it so it's believable for the person in the front row and believable for the person in the last yeah, row. Totally. And I think that that's why a lot of people are like, oh, wrestling's over the top. Because if you did something that was that over the top on camera, it would play at very big, I feel like. Yeah. <laughs> Everything I do seems to play very big. So I'm still coasted on that subtlety. Like the thing you said. It's true. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think as you get older, you also kind of settle into your skin a little bit, you know, and get a little more confident and like <laughs> life beats you down so enough. You're like, okay, you know, I, I don't know. Sometimes it's like I recently bought the rights to Bozo the Clown and I was yeah. like, I went out to, to premiere Bozo on New Year's Eve and it's just looking around and Nobody was smiling. Nobody was like, there's a lot of pain right now in the world. So I don't know why I brought it up. But there, because like, as you get older, there's something about like, you're not as like, I don't know. It's almost like when you're starting out acting or like when you're younger, I guess it is. You're just full of all this optimism and, yeah. and, and confidence and 
then the world kind of beats you down and then you're like, oh, you're a little more weary about stuff and a little more guarded and a little less trustworthy. What? <laughs> <laughs> Trusting. <laughs> well, sometimes trustworthy too. It depends what on happened, what yeah. decisions you're making. <laughs> when you first read the script for Scream, and you realize, like, okay, this is the character I'm going to be. Did you just like flip to the last page and go, oh my gosh, my character is still alive. No, I wasn't supposed to live in the first one. What? Wes Craven brought me back. Like after uh, they had been seeing the dailies and the people were liking the performance. And So there is footage out there of Dewey dying. Uh, well, Dewey one? just sort of gets sort of killed, like stabbed in the back yeah. in the first one. And then uh, Wes is like, I'll put you in a... A gurney. We'll see if you make it. You raise your hand up, give us a thumbs up or something. So thank you, Wes. So Wes really like was just so amazing and really was a mentor in a lot of different ways and really was supportive and kept me alive. You know, we, you were talking right before, and there were a few times like definitely during Scream Four and uh, maybe during Scream Three. But we were having discussions about where the script was going because it wasn't sort of complete. As they go, they start turning them out so they are always kind of playing catch up with the scripts. But I was always suggesting, because there is like little red herring moments for Dewey where he's like, you know, and then, it, you know, his sister got killed. And I was just always interested in like, maybe, you know, what if he was like, I always thought of it because it would be the biggest like, what do you mean moment? You yeah. Know, like, ah, oh, because you're always looking for those moments to sort of surprise the audience or break their hearts or like, you know, I know. So uh, were there early versions of any of the Scream movies where Dewey was the killer? Uh, I don't think there were any drafts. I may Just have pitched idea. it before, yeah. I pitched for us to have had a daughter in Scream 4 because we actually had a daughter. You and Gail's character? Yeah, yeah. so that was, that was funny. But uh, he didn't want to do that either. <laughs> it, it, like everything else you said, like it would be totally like, you know, life imitating art. Yeah, or yeah. Or art imitating life, I guess. I know. I mean, yeah. I'm still not sure if, <laughs> the, who knows, the internet might go crazy, but... Gail was really upset with my relationship with Marley Shelton's character, the uh, Sheriff Judy in the fourth one. Yeah. So what if something had happened there? And then, you know, there's this kid, Wes, that is in the new Scream. I'm no, I'm, I'm just saying. I like that his name's Wes. <laughs> yeah, me too. That's good. That was really sweet. And they that- were really smart. Uh, Matt and Tyler, the directors, did an incredible job. And, and Jamie and Guy, the writers, were amazing. They put an incredible script together. And but I imagine it's, it's, it's tough to make a Scream movie without Wes. It was. Yeah. It was really tough. But he was there a lot, like in spirit. and I don't know. I, I felt like I, I kept him in mind a lot while I was doing it. I kept, um, even like in between, while you're doing scenes, thinking about him and thinking about times we had in between picking up the phone and making a phone call, you know, these Mm. little things. Because if you, as an actor, if you could be thinking a lot of things, you know, nobody can see what's going on in your head. So you're thinking about things that sort of relate in a way to what you're kind of experiencing as a character. Those thoughts play, you know what I mean? They play and, and you can't really act it. You can't, I don't know, I find it hard to, for stuff, I try to always find stuff out of like the character, the moment, yeah. what you're experiencing, what yeah. you've experienced in your past that's similar. When you've embodied so many characters throughout your career, they call me Dick. <laughs> they call me Boo. Boo. I don't know how those guys like take the time to like cut all those things together. Well, one of your fans needs to do this for you. It's a long video though. But they call me Boo. Boo. They call me David Arquette. That's not me. That's not my name. But <laughs> when, when you've embodied so many characters, though, is it difficult or at any point in your career, have you forgotten who David is? <laughs> who <laughs> Who's is David? It? Who am I? <laughs> no, no. <sighs> no, along the journey of life, yeah, I've like made a lot of 
the wrong turns and luckily come came back safely but I could have easily not you know but it's really you know it's you know that's part of it like figuring out like how to stay focused and how to channel your energy in the right way and how to get into the flow that's really what I've experienced like because you know I've had my things with you know drugs and alcohol and you know in the past and and uh you know, even smoking pot, like I just can't do anything anymore because mm. it gets me out of the flow. Mm. And I just need to sort of like stay in it just to like, because when you stay into the flow, it sounds so corny, but when you stay into the flow, you start seeing magical things happening and like little things. You just like, even like songs come on or like, you know, connections happen to people. Um, I just think like, I don't know. I was kind of beating myself up for so long that it was really important for me not to do that anymore. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> to start uh, kind of just, uh, you know, getting, like Bruce Lee says, uh, be like, like water. water. Yeah. yeah. But when you're in that flow, and look, how is it like you're on set, you're getting into that character, and then you guys rap, and then you kind of leave that character behind for a little while. Then a year-ish later, you go into promotion mode for the film, and you go, oh, yeah, we did this, this, this. Maybe you even see the film. And then promotion mode kind of ends, and then is it back to being you again? Yeah, I mean, you're really only... I don't know how other actors do it. I mean, some people might get into character. It was funny, I was... It was during COVID, so it was really isolated anyway. Dewey's character was isolated, so the place we were staying had like a little kitchenette, the hotel we were staying in. So I just went to the supermarket alone, I got groceries, cooked for myself. I didn't go out to really any restaurants. I had a couple meals with the younger cast, but for the most part, I was alone a lot of it, which mm. he was too. Yeah. So I do little things like that. I don't really get into character. Like, I don't know. I mean, I've done some roles where I'm playing darker characters and it seems like your life becomes a little bit more, you know, scary in a way. You Not scary, but like you might put yourself in, you know, be hanging around people that, you know, would be dangerous or whatever. I don't know. It's probably just what happened when you became a pro wrestler. That's, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the thing about doing things that you're actually like, it's <laughs> you doing it. You, know, you really like have no uh, character guard. <laughs> How do you explain to people who aren't wrestling fans the whole Nick Gage situation? <laughs> well, there's this thing called the death match. <laughs> and if you get offered to do one, Say no. no. Um, they're like, wait a second. It's called a death match? Like, yeah. are you supposed to kill the other person? Yeah, I didn't know that that's a possibility. And wait a second. There's ultraviolet stuff? What's that? I didn't know what the ultraviolet thing was. I didn't know. And he said, this is the part where we're going to do the ultraviolet. So I was like, oh, okay. Is that kind of like in Seinfeld where they're like, and blah, 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 the match ends. Yeah, yeah. There was a lot of that, actually. You should have seen what was supposed to come next. Well, I was supposed to go through a barbed wire wall. I was going to, uh, there was a bunch of stuff I was supposed to go through. I didn't care. I mean, but something happened. I saw Nick Mondo's amazing documentary about death matches before I did that. And he asked somebody in that, like, why are you doing this? Like, because, like, there's something inside us that, you know, is it's almost like, you know, trying to numb the pain by getting pain or something. Okay. But uh, he was like, why are you doing this? Yes, some, somebody, you know. And I was thinking about that. It was a really kind of pivotal thing I learned with doing the documentary was that, God, I've been beating myself up for so long. Like, why? Like, what is all you that about? You mean internally, not physically. Internally, yeah. mentally. I still like, battle with that all the time. I mean, the negative voice in our heads is like my biggest enemy now. You know, you, especially since you don't, like drink a few beers to sort of quiet it down, you know, so you kind of like have to find other ways going on hikes or, you know, hanging out with people you're really comfortable with or yeah. doing art. You know, there's a lot of ways through doing music. Well, the funny thing about 
like if we talk about WCW, the funny thing about television wrestling is it's very fast paced. It's a new episode every single week and it's yeah. two hours or three hours with Nitro. And they're writing stuff in the moment that's going to happen in the moment. And I think maybe you forget that this is going to live on forever, yeah. whether it's good or it's bad or it's somewhere in between. Like wrestling fans don't forget. Right. And I think that that's, that was kind of the space you had to, you were forced to live in for 20 years. Yeah. You were thrown into this thing that probably felt very impromptu in the moment, probably seemed like a good idea from Eric Bischoff and DDP. And here we are 20 years later still talking about it. Yeah. <clears throat> Well, I do like I do feel blessed that I kind of have a connection to wrestling that I got to see behind the curtain of something I love so much. I still sort of stand true to the the idea that I was kind of one of like the first band champs. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so it's like I've actually lived that dream of 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 that thing. I mean, the fact that I was an actor obviously taints it, but um. I don't know. I, I wouldn't change it for the world. And I learned so much from it. I really respect wrestlers and what they experience. I can't believe the guys like that I was wrestling when I was wrestling the second time. Seeing them come up and then just seeing them do it all the time. I just, you know, if you're doing it all the time, your body's kind of used to it. And you also get into the flow of it so you can like... You're just way better <laughs> at wrestling sure, yeah. <laughs> when you do it all the time. So you know you know how to roll better. You know you know the, but also the chances of something you know banging around are higher. I don't know, but like there's a lot of celebrities that do the one match, right? And you could have easily done one more match. What made you decide I'm going to go be an indie wrestler and like tour around and like make this a thing? Because I wanted to uh, find out why the fans got so mad at me. I wanted to figure out what is wrestling. Like, I've always loved it, but what's it all about? And uh, I wanted to just experience it. I wanted to, you know, <laughs> I guess I wanted to go go to my hotel room and it not be there and <laughs> just be like oh oh gosh i guess i'm not getting a hotel room tonight or oh, you mean you go to check in and they're yeah. like i'm sorry mr arquette yeah. there's no room for you <laughs> no because it was bought on a you know uh you know one of those other kind of ways and then they had overbooked like it. travelocity or yeah expedia or something yeah <laughs> but you know so they didn't have a room for me so you're like with your bags in the middle of nowhere like were they like booking you like you were an indie wrestler like we've all heard the stories were they booking you on spirit airlines where you're paying for your own bags or were you able to go okay guys like at least fly me on american or united or delta or something it was a little bit of a different situation because i was shooting the documentary so a lot of the time i'd say oh, i'm gonna i get to use the footage so i wouldn't be paid sometimes i get paid sometimes people would fly me out but a lot of the time i was sort of doing stuff on my own there were a few places that treated me right first rest first a few places <laughs> that's <laughs> terrifying well yeah it's a terrifying <laughs> world i mean when i mean essentially i you know i may have been a former champion but i was a green you know wrestler so you know and uh i don't know uh, there were different I, I, I don't know. I took a different approach to it. I like being able to help smaller uh, indie wrestling companies that kind of, you know, you come in with like all these demands and it's just taking away from the sort of overall yeah. what they could make. If you have the, you know, the, the ways it means that to not have to, you know, it's not going to kill me one way or another. I don't know. It's a weird way of looking at it. I don't even like charging people to sign stuff. It just makes me uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> I know. It's like against all this stuff. And even in the horror conventions and all this stuff. And I love meeting the fans. But it always just is awkward to me. And I have social anxiety. So it's like this combo of like, I'm awkward and uncomfortable. And I feel bad about this. I, I remember I was coming out here for a lot for work before I moved out to L.A. And people would be like, oh, you know, uh, we've been training at David Arquette's house. I'm like, hold on, what? <laughs> like, oh, yeah, he's a ring in his backyard. Yeah, Jungle Boy, Peter Avalon, Luchasaurus. Yeah. I'm like, hold on, what? That was my favorite so time. 
Do you still have a ring? No, I gave it to Jungle Boy. <laughs> That's just an amazing part of the story. He, he's just such an incredible dude. And Love that guy. Yeah, and he and his dad and his family came over, and we all hung out in the ring. I don't know. It was just uh, meaningful, and I thought, well, he'll put it to you. I mean, that guy's so incredible. And but you got trained to be a pro wrestler in your own backyard. Yeah. By, it was Peter, Peter Avalon. Avalon. Yeah, he wow. was amazing. Yeah. Met him through, um, I called him up, you know, through Dave Marquez and, and the championship yeah. wrestling from Hollywood. And he picked up the phone and we got to talking. First training section, I puked my guts out and, and <laughs> Oxnard. Yeah, he, he, just, he ran, ran me really. Is that and, for uh, bumps or what? Yeah, I had also broken a, a rib and. Well, that was later, but uh, yeah, no, that was just from bumps and being out of shape and just like, he just, you know, he, it was real wrestling training. You, you know, Man. there's a lot of just stuff that happens in those rings. And yeah, and then one of my first matches, I, I uh, cracked a couple of ribs. And then I had to like do this match with RJ City and just keep slamming myself down. And like, I don't know if you've ever had cracked ribs or but it's so painful anyway like sneezing or coughing but then like taking on these bumps I, then i had one session with scorpio sky too and i barely could do anything because i i, I, I kept asking people because i'd gotten a couple x-rays and they're like no it's nothing then i had to get like some i don't know like an mri or something because I was like, there's, then there's something wrong with me because I'm in so much pain. Yeah. And then they found it. It was like under one of these lower ones or somewhere in here where they couldn't see it. But um. But there's a lot of people that would be going through this pain, and you're in your mid 40s at the time when you're, that's amazing, training to become a pro wrestler for the first time. There's a lot of people that would go, yeah, you know what? This hurts a lot. What am I doing? I don't need to do this. Yeah. I would already started it though, and it was almost like. Um, I really did want to sort of figure the all, really the lesson I learned was the, you know, the deathmatch wrestling is stop beating yourself up so much. You mm -hmm. know, that's really what it was. And a lot of things came together. I was still drinking a little through on and off through that time period. So then really leaving that, you know, self abusive part behind, it was really, you know, it, it made a I don't know. I learned a lot. It was therapy it, for him. Yeah, it was wow. very painful, expensive <laughs> therapy. <laughs> like, I don't know. It, it definitely feels like it was like it got you from where you were to where you are now. Yeah, yeah, and it was pretty interesting. I mean, I the this whole thing then scream happens, and I don't know. A lot of things started coming together after that. But I feel like the rest of the world didn't understand this. Like when you were on mainstream talk shows and you're like, yeah, I'm trying to be a pro wrestler. They're kind of like, you were like, they made you the butt of the joke. I know. Well, it's funny. I see that a lot. And it's like, it's like with Bozo, I'm going around telling people it's all about kindness. Kindness is key. And you got to laugh, keep on laughing. And all this people are looking at me like, Oh, be like a clown. Like even my wife, she thinks it's super cringy. <laughs> so I'm like, Oh, <laughs> My kids are playing my song I wrote. There's like, Dad, you're off key. And, you know, <laughs> this is so embarrassing. Don't scream while you're talking to me as a clown. But the fact of the matter is you kind of have to like, you know where you're going and, and what your point is. Or And then once you go on the journey, there's all of these like things that happen. Like you have to redirect and like, I don't know, but you, I don't know, just go after what you believe in. It's kind of a cliche, but you know, it's kind of like, I just know that people will catch up and be like, oh, you know what, clowns are cool. Like, oh, not really? <laughs> you know, way after you've been the joke. And even like when wrestling, I mean, I was talking to Cody Rhodes about trying to have him in the film. And it was right as it, like all the AEW stuff was coming together. But it, I don't know why I said that, but... Um, did you want to have a match with him? Yeah, I did. <laughs> I thought it would be so like funny. Like, it would be. disrespected the belt and my dad. And I'm going to pay you back. That was my sort of pitch to him. But uh, it was all during the beginning of that. But 
we had started that documentary way before, and then this whole explosion in wrestling. So as much as people are leading back, I mean, I still think Hollywood doesn't take wrestling as seriously as they should. I mean, knowing, like, seeing what The Rock can do with his career and, yeah. and everything, the fan base is so, like, like, amazing. Well, there's a lot of Dwayne Johnson fans that have never seen The Rock wrestle. No kidding. That is there, ridiculous. There is <laughs> even, I think, I'm starting to be a lot of John Cena fans who no have kidding. never seen a John Cena match. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's so funny. Right? I know. It's crazy. I know. They, a lot of people just write it off. and They don't have the time enough to understand, like, oh, this is incredible. It's a little circusy. Well, they want to be where you're at, and you did the reverse. And that's what's so funny about yeah. it, you know? <laughs> so, I know. It's so funny. I know. It's so crazy. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't know. Like, but I think the, at the core of your story, what's so impressive is that you started training to become a pro wrestler in your mid-40s. And I think there's a lot of people that go, it doesn't necessarily need to be wrestling, but they go, oh, I'd love to do that thing, but I'm too old now. I could never do that thing because I'm 35 or 45 or 55 or whatever. And you basically went, I'm going to do this thing anyway. Yeah, <laughs> that's what you got to do, I think, like in general. And that's what I, that's my philosophy in life. Like a lot of people say they want to be famous or something. You know, if you do a play, a local play, if you put your own play together, if you take some acting classes and then just perform somewhere, perform in a part, like you're going to get a buzz. You're going to yeah. have the experience of putting it together. You're going to do it. You can even do it on your phone. You can make a little movie on your phone. It takes a lot of work and preparation, but if you want to do it, it's like a lot of the time it's like cleaning out a garage. Like a garage looks so daunting to clean out, but you're like, okay, let's start in this corner. You go through these boxes and then you start putting things, you start throwing some stuff out and you find a place for others and then you put some shelves up and then you like stack the boxes and then you, your garage is clean. It's almost like you do that with whatever you believe in and you yeah. start just going after the one thing. If you want to write a book or anything, you just like do 2,000 words a day and you just keep yeah. doing it and keep doing it. And by the time you're like, oh shoot, I wrote all this, then you edit it and then you like go through it and then you have some read it and give their notes and you take it back. It's all just a process. Yeah. I've been saying this a lot, especially lately, is just start. Yeah. Like, I think that so many people get right up against that thing that they want to do, and then they never take the first step. And well, you know this from living in Los Angeles for a long time. A lot of people's first step is to move out here, and then they never put on any work when they get here. They go, yeah. yeah, I moved from the Midwest or Nebraska or wherever to Hollywood. I made it. Yeah. And then they never actually put in any work. Yeah, I think it's, I don't know, I'm learning more and more, it's all about the work, like all about the constant like work, you know, especially in this town, like you'll work on an independent film you want to get produced for two years and it goes nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that happens, I can't tell you how many times I've done that, or like a TV show or this or that. As you get older, you start recognizing, well, I really love the idea, I just don't have the bandwidth to like, pour the time into doing it yeah you know and there's all these great projects that you know if just you had these one couple things they'd be amazing but all putting those one couple things together <laughs> takes a lot of effort too so you have to kind of like you know find out exactly what you want to do and focus on it what's the best advice you'd have for someone who's moving out here and trying to be where you're at trying to succeed as an actor well, right now, there's so many avenues. Like, this phone alone is like, you know, the newest versions of them. You can shoot a film quality thing. Yeah, cinematic <laughs> mode's unreal. I mean, and editing, and you can like learn all that stuff. And it takes a lot of effort. If you just want to act or whatever, you can like get involved with some of the, you know, acting, really great acting coaches here, or plays, or find your own play and put it up somewhere rent the theater if you can or you know find people that will invest in you i mean it's always like this game of you know finding investors or finding projects or finding the people to attach to them and that whole thing but if you i don't know if you're determined and you won't let anything stop you especially with this that's why i say like you can you know you can start what I've been noticing more and more is like, do what you love. Like, 
if you're posting stuff, post things you love. Mm. And then it will resonate. Like, people will understand. Like, oh, you know, and, and people will kind of gravitate toward the things that they could, there's an authenticity to it. So if you find some piece that you really love or you can write something you really love or if you just figure out what you want to express or your story, if you want to tell, like everyone has a story. Yeah. Everyone wants to tell their story. It's really, you know, unless you tell it yourself, it's hard for you to like bring it to someone and say, here, you want to make my story? Yeah. What do you think? What do you think is the best advice that you've received? It doesn't necessarily need to be about the industry, just maybe about life. What, what's the best piece of advice? Shoot, I'm really bad at remembering <laughs> stuff. But, um, uh, I mean, my personal, like the things that <laughs> Bozo's saying and, and stuff, it's really love yourself. You really have to love yourself because you could be your worst enemy. Uh, and when you like figure that out, then you recognize the voice. If you have a negative voice in your head, which I think most of us do, mm. then um, you have to recognize that voice and mm. not allow it power. Um, but really, just staying focused, believe in yourself. Like that's the other thing, and like believe in your dreams, and really put the work into it. Like nothing happens, mm. you know, without really putting that work in. What do you think was the role or the moment that really took things to the next level for you? Maybe it was a coaster. Maybe it was an audition you got but didn't end up booking it. No, I mean, there was a... I mean, the, the, the day Scream came out, I had an audition and two voiceover auditions, and I didn't get any of them. So it's like, you know, I'm you know, 33 years in the business and that's, you know, this weekend we're having this big movie and I still can't get a job. Oh, you mean this last scream? Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. No, this, it never ends. You know what I mean? <laughs> that's that hustle, that going after the next job. It never ends. It's, it's not like I'm sitting here right now and pe most people wouldn't say this because they'll keep up their air of like, you know, stardom and movie star. But no, it's a hustle. You, you Most people think that you are leafing through a bunch of different scripts and you're the one saying no. There are some that, that might be true about, like these indie movies, but I've done so many of them and it's like you don't really get paid too much for a super low budget movie. Sure. Even if you believe in the director, I can commit to those, but it's usually like, you know, two weeks, I have to work it out with my family. You're not getting paid anything. It typically ends up costing you money because, you know, I live in Nashville. They don't have money to fly me back and forth and see my family. So then, you know what I mean? So there are some, you know, opportunities like that. Yeah. But I've also done a lot of that, and I've, I'm kind of like playing a little bit more of the Hollywood game and waiting to work with the right people and the right projects rather than just doing stuff to, like, help people out and... I don't know, I'm just looking after myself and, and then focusing on things like Bozo, which I'm really, you know, yeah, you're really taking a lot of work. <laughs> I mean, it's just taking a ton of work, you know. But well, was there an audition or a role early on where you went, oh my God, finally, yes, I've been putting so much work into this, this is going to really help take things to the next level? I mean, there's a couple. There was a movie I did called John's really on, early on where uh, Scott Silver, amazing writer-director who wrote the Joker just recently uh, he was directing it was one of his first things and that was really cool because we were both all young I worked with Lucas Haas who's an amazing actor Terrence Howard Arliss Howard all these really great actors so that gave me a real feeling yeah you know I had three months to study for it I lived right by Santa Monica Boulevard where all the male hustlers lived I mean worked so we were all like hanging out at the Formosa Cafe in Hollywood. So I would walk there because I never uh, tried, uh, you know, uh, although I drank and stuff, I tried never to drive. So I would walk there and I'd give like these hustlers five bucks and I'd say, what's the craziest thing that's ever happened to you out of here? Where are you from? What do your parents think? Um, what's in your pockets? I just had this list of questions and you know, through the process, I just was able to, like, at one point I met the kid with the, you know, teardrop tattoo like my character had in the movie. I kind of, like, and then a month later, like, after I'd shot the movie, I ran into the kid, and he was all, like, 
skinny and it had been shot in the head from fucking oh. like this was, yeah so it's like this crazy world that i'd been able to just really like you know like infiltrate. have the opportunity yeah. to then put all that into the into the role mm. and um so that gave me like a real acting experience of like my first like character that i just owned kind of in, in a way yeah yeah and then i mean sc scream changed your life that changed my life in so many ways in a lot of ways yeah. personally and professionally you ever think so about like, what your life would be like if your audition wasn't good for that or if yeah. you weren't what wes was looking for well wes they had called me in for one of the younger like one of the billy loomis or the Stu walker roles that i was like i just there's something about this role dewey and he was written as this big jock and uh, they didn't know I was a professional wrestler. I, I, wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't at the time. But, uh, yeah, ready to rumble, hadn't come out yet. Yeah. yeah. Well, still in my heart, in my kid brain, I was the champion. I always was. <laughs> but uh, no. So I was like, I really love that role. I think I could bring something weird to it or different to it. Um, so yeah, I don't know. If, if that movie hadn't happened, it would be a totally different experience for me. There's a line in this new Scream movie where they talk about how the Stab movies was a lot of people's introduction to horror films. What was your introduction to horror films? Well, I always loved like The Shining and just Jack uh, Nicholson's performance and that was just so intense. Yeah. Um, you know, all those like 70s, like 80s, the, uh, the Omen and uh, original Halloween, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I mean, all those really scary ones were, were great back then. When you first read Scream, did it read how it ended up on on screen? A little bit. I mean, one thing that I think this this version and that version captured was really that we were those kind of that age group. We were kind of like. Wes was smart enough to allow us little like ad lib moments and like messing around with each other. And it was of the time and it was like how kids were acting. And it was very meta too. Yeah. Yeah. Which I think was so smart because you're looking at it and you're going, wait a second, you're explaining how this movie's working while we're watching this movie. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I know that was Kevin Williamson really. And Wes, like he also, you know, had that with the, one of his Nightmare on Elm Street films where they kind of turned the, so I think he was toying with that a lot in a, in a way. What do you, like, if wrestling was the goal for, you know, that point in your life, I guess Bozo's the goal right now? Or, like, what, you know, you could act till you're 150, which is the best thing about <laughs> acting. What are the next 100 years for Especially you? Especially like? since they're going to scan us soon and just <laughs> AI David Arquette, and then I'll, that's what I'll be. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I mean, right now I'm focusing on Bozo. I have two kids. I mean, I have three kids, but two young kids that, um, that <laughs> the seven year old's like, this is so embarrassing. Do they watch your films? No, not really. I mean, no. Have they seen Scream? Have any of your kids no, seen Scream? No, no. Uh, Does Coco, Coco seen saw the last one. Is it weird was, for her to see you guys both on screen? I I don't know. It was we tried to watch the first one once, and she was like, I, "I'm tapping out. I can't do this." <laughs> but uh, she watched this last one, and uh, we weren't there. But uh, she watched it and she reported watched back, it and she was like, "It was like at a fan event." So she was like. So I think she had a, it, we kind of got some parent cred there because she was like, oh, wow, you guys actually, you know, know how to act. And, and then, spoiler <laughs> alert, she's like, oh, you died really well, too. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I know. Oh, it still hurts. Oh. I don't I know. Mean, they didn't really have to really stab me. I mean, because I was a little, like, they took something out of Nick Gage's handbook to really stab me. I mean, really, guys? How do those knives work, by the way? They look oh, so authentic. Them. Well, nowadays, they Is can it the knife just that springs have the back handles. In? Sometimes they have the spring ones, but sometimes those get handle? caught, too. So handle and it's The worst is like when you get stabbed with a, a retractable one and it doesn't go and it kind of like gets you. <laughs> There's like some funky stuff. But now nowadays, they can add blades and so it's just a handle and the cgi blade sometimes or sometimes it's rubber and they just make them look better i thought for sure when they announced that they were doing a fifth scream that either you or sydney prescott was going to somehow be wearing the ghost face mask yeah i mean 
It could have made, well, we, we could have a Scream 6, perhaps. Yeah, well, I mean, you could. <laughs> no, there is a, they just announced they're doing a Scream 6. It's happening. I'm so sorry that. Uh... <laughs> I know, you're throwing me. <laughs> <laughs> like, There'll be a throwback. There'll be like a flashback, right? No, I don't know. There'll be a That's photo not, of it's Dewey. Not the same. <laughs> and you still get paid, right? No, you don't. What? <laughs> Pay for a picture? I don't know, not really. <laughs> but still, 26 years later, you're probably still getting royalty checks for the first Scream. I guess so. I mean, yeah, they don't, they're not as like. <laughs> not as big as they were in the Yeah, 90s. yeah, back yeah. then. The films that are that old, they're, they're, yeah, they're not. It's, it's all good. It's definitely like feel blessed to be in the position. But, um, yeah. I've, I'm just so curious as we, you know, head towards the end of this interview. As a former WCW champion yourself, what is your favorite WCW match of all time? Jeez, oh, I'm really terrible about all that. <laughs> all right, how about just match of all I time? Mean, I mean, I don't know. Like, the bash, it, what was the, I don't know. I'm just in my head. I'm We're talking like, about the Hogan heel turn here? So. Or the, like, the Sturgis? Didn't they have, like, some crazy, I don't know. I thought I saw some, uh, just in, in doing the thing. I was watching a bunch of old tapes, and the the one match where they had a bunch of motorcycles like that whole. I didn't watch it the whole. as much WCW. Yeah, definitely watch a lot more WWF. Yeah, me too. I mean, I was an old school, old school wrestling fan, so I liked like Junkyard Dog. And, oh, okay, and, yeah, and um, and uh, Andre the Giant, Macho Man. And Miss Elizabeth. I remember Hulk. doing this because Coco Beware. Yeah. I remember the Repo Man. Yeah. That was like when I first got introduced to it. Yeah. What? Do you have a favorite match? Uh, probably Ricky Steamboat and Macho Man. WrestleMania three. Three. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess so. I th people just say that, but when I was, and I had probably seen it back. It's weird. I see stuff and I was like, oh wait, oh, I did see this way back then, but um. Yeah, I love George the Animal Steel and all of his weird, like, you know, yeah. eating the turnbuckle and, <laughs> you know, and then you go really far back and, like, Google Gorgeous George and just see right. what he did. Like, that kind of stuff is so amazing <laughs> to me. Yeah, I, it's, and it's a different era now. And a lot yeah, of your friends are... a lot are, of really incredible stuff happening now. A lot of your the friends Lucha are doing it, yeah. Were, those guys, my, one of my favorite wrestling experiences was watching them. And he's like, I'm going to, after this match, I'm going to smoke two cigars and eat two cheeseburgers. <laughs> one of the best things about your documentary is watching you hit the Canadian Destroyer. Oh, man. It's so good. Oh, man. Yeah, that's all. You work with someone like Jack Perry, Jungle Boy, <laughs> and they make you look really good. I mean... At that point, it was at the end of the whole run, so I'd already kind of gotten the confidence. You know, there's a lot of that that you get. You have to get like there's a <laughs> there's this whole thing like if you think you're going to slow in a wrestling match, slow down. Yeah. You know all of these little things about being in the moment, and you can, it's almost <laughs> like once you do that, I still have a hard time like being in the moment, even in an interview, like I'll watch it back and be like, I wasn't even listening. And even they're probably at home saying like, you sure talk a lot. <laughs> no, <laughs> this is the whole, that's how they're supposed to work. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> how easy was WWE to work with when you're trying to get footage for the documentary? Um, Cause they own everything. Yeah, I mean, I had gone to them really early on <clears throat> to want to do it with them before any death match was involved or anything like that. <laughs> but, um, it didn't work out or they weren't really interested. They didn't really get what, I don't know. It was just a whole mixed. I had a bad experience, actually my fault. I, I like hosted a raw, they had like the, you know, general manager, like temporary yeah. general manager. Yeah. The guest and then there was manager. scream four was coming out and I contacted triple H and I was like, I think this could be cool. And I went out there and I, I don't know. I was, Oh, it was after Scream 4. Yeah, I was just in a bad place. I was going through the divorce, and I was starting this nightclub, and it was just, you know, pretty wild. And uh, it was in New Orleans, and I just ended up staying up all night, and, like, you know, came in just 
my voice was gone. I been screaming in New Orleans all night. <laughs> Sound like Ghostface, yeah. Yeah, I did. I really did. And I went out and I was like, I was trying to get heel heat or something. Like, ah, this town, New Orleans. But it was kind of off script, and I think I just pissed off Vince. I'm pretty sure. Oh, wow. I didn't mean to. I really have utmost respect for. But I didn't know. Like, I didn't. Uh, I didn't. I wasn't aware. Like, was so no one really smartened me up too much to like make sure not to do this. Stay out. Like, I don't know. Like, I almost thought of it as like. A, I guess I was thinking it was like it was a house show, but it was bra. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Where I'm just trying to get like them mad at me or whatever. Yeah. I don't know. It was a bad move. Did you go back through the curtain and like just feel like a cold reaction? Yeah, I I did. Yeah. I thought that was always my reaction. <laughs> Remember, I used to go out the curtain and everybody would be like, what are you doing? Like, you don't know what you're doing. And you don't. That's why I had to like do the wrestling thing. And then I get like all the respect element. And then I get yeah. all of this like yeah. history. And then I got like, you know, just, you know, there's all these no cells of like no cell like interactions and stuff. There's all these like weird, you know, somebody's talking to you what they're talking about and they're trying to take you down and they're talking right to you smiling at you and I'm not good like that I'm like I'm like a gullible fan <laughs> you know what I mean so a lot of this stuff I'm like yeah okay sure sure light tubes but um I don't know I would I don't know that's one thing that was a little upsetting especially with AEW because I had all the guys that were in AEW in the movie and I wanted to go and like just do a match or something at the, you know, to promote yeah. the movie. They're like, no, uh I think it was TNT though, and they were like, try to charge me <laughs> to wrestle. I was like, oh. TNT was going to charge you to wrestle? No, but I think it was like it went through the, the, um, like publicity? Yeah, the publicity department to like TNT or something. And they were like, well, it costs oh. this much to like, I was like, no, you guys don't. I'm, they want, Forget oh, it. wow, they were seeing this like a, as an advertisement. Yeah, I mean, we were, want, we were looking to advertise, uh, you know, on, on like the shows or, or at least some, some form of advertisement within AEW. But yeah, they looked at it as like, well, we charge this much for someone to promote in the ring. I was like, well, Man. <laughs> yeah, that was a little like depressing because I knew all a bunch of the guys over there. Yeah. Your your documentary is unbelievable, though. I don't think Where so. can people find it? Where's the best people place it's for people to find Hulu, it? It's on Hulu, I think. It's on... You Cannot Kill David Arquette. Yeah, it's on... I think it's on iTunes or whatever. I feel like you might be like, we really can't kill you. Do you have a scar on your neck? <laughs> yeah, this is a big job. Oh, my God. It hit my neck muscle, which saved me. I got a bunch of stitches on the muscle. The greatest, the greatest thing no one talks about, or at least it kind of just gets glossed over with that match, is you are profusely bleeding out of your neck. You're feeling it throbbing. You get out of the ring, and you're like, F this, I'm going to the hospital. And then you turn around and go, I got to finish the match. <laughs> it's insane. <laughs> that was insane. But I did go like this, and Luke was there that night, and... He said, Davy Luke. I said, Luke, is it pumping? Because we'd known Luke for, for years before that. He lived at our house in L.A. He's an amazing guy. But I was like, Luke, is it pumping? He's like, no, it's not pumping. So I knew I wasn't like going to bleed out at that moment. <laughs> and you but finished the I match. Back, I went back in, and then he hits me with the fucking light tube again. Or this motherfucker with the light tube to grab the chair and hit him. I, was, I went to go try to choke him at that point because I was just fucking pissed. And he judo flipped me in. It's like, don't get up or I'll fucking kill you. <laughs> the fact, though, that you went back in and finished the match, that's, that's what a true wrestler would do. <laughs> Thank you. I think you've earned everyone's respect. Uh, well, the funniest thing about that is when I walked into that place, they were like, boo! They couldn't, like, they hated me so much. Like, they really wanted to kill me. And then, boom, like, everyone's witnessing of death. <laughs> and then it's just like, oh, shit, everyone. Yeah, like, well, they and realize you're a really, human. Yeah, and it really got, like, freaked out. And, like, 
but you know, right before that, there's the, like blood, like this really weird feeling. But then I started doing crazy stuff, and then boom! Once I got hit in my neck, it was like, oh shit! And like, and then I walked out, and it was like this weird, like quiet. Mm. And that's when I went back in. And then when I left, <laughs> then it was like, wow. Like, <laughs> and then actually there's something that's not in the thing, but I turned around because Nick Cage started like, don't come in like my ring. It's like, I get it. Like, I guess he was still doing his thing. But I was like, I tried to start saying something and I was kind of getting teary. <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm giving an asshole. <laughs> I would like nearly cried right at the end. But I did win them back, like over. Like I literally won some of the like hard, hardest core wrestling yeah. fans over. What would you say is the role that most people know you for? Definitely. Scream? Yeah. yeah. Then what, what's number two and three then? Um, I mean, Ready to Rumble is probably right up there. And then I'm not even sure. Like, I'm not sure. Maybe you guys can write under this. What do you think? But I don't know. After that, it's probably more my relationship stuff or my life. Yeah. Life, my, you know. Well, I mean, when you were married to Courtney and, uh, you know, Friends was one of the biggest shows on TV at the time. Yeah. So, yeah, I guess that's. And I did an episode of Friends. So that's, that's true. Probably yeah. Like, because the people see me, and they're like, oh, you're from Friends. And I was like, <laughs> I'm from Friends. I was the stalker of friend. I was the <laughs> friend. It's like saying Brad Pitt's the guy from Friends, you yeah. know? <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for coming by. Hey, thank you. Thanks for having me. I, uh, I end every conversation with the same questions, so I will ask it of you. I'm all about gratitude. I start and end every day saying out loud three things I'm grateful for. That's the key, man. What are three things in your life that you're grateful for? <laughs> my three children. <laughs> but uh, my, my children, for sure, my wife, and um, my health. I mean, yeah, you're still my with family, us. my family, you know, I don't know, <laughs> my friends. Well, that's, I don't know, that's more than three. But um, uh, You can keep going, yeah. yeah, you're, yeah. you're still, uh, oh, your health. Oh, that's really like. Your health's got to be a big thing. You're still with us through everything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's what, uh, Yeah. Appreciate you. Thank you. I appreciate you. You're yeah. awesome. I you're the best. And thank you you're for coming by and making this happen. Thank you. And you're the best. Don't forget that. That's one thing you have to remember. You're the greatest in your world. I'm the greatest in mine. So treat everyone that way. And we'll have a great world.